Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week has been a public figure for around 20 years. She burst into our lives as a pop star. Jamelia had lots of hit records, top 20 hits, albums, um, but after about 10 years, she moved into more of a television career and has been famous on programs like Loose Women. She's made documentaries. She's often a sort of a, an opinionated and valuable voice on programs like Channel 4 News when we want to talk about social issues and change. So it's really nice to have you on the podcast, Jamelia. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honoured to be here today. <laughs> where, are, where are you? Are you at home? I'm, I'm at home in Birmingham, yeah. Yes, so, I mean, I, I really want to begin, you know, at the beginning kind of thing of where, where this all started, um, because you were a very young pop star um, with big dreams from not, not an especially easy background. Mm, no, oh, tell no. Me about childhood. So um, I grew up, um, I grew up in Birmingham, inner city Birmingham, Hockley, uh, with my mum and my two younger brothers. So essentially in a single parent family, although I didn't feel strange because uh, the area that I grew up in was predominantly single parent families. So I felt very normal. And yeah, it was a very kind of tight knit community focused uh, community. Uh, which I loved. I had a very full childhood. My mum worked at the local play centre. Um, I had a front row seat. I was there the day she volunteered to seeing her climb the ranks and become the manager of the whole establishment. So that was very inspiring um, as a young girl. I think I, I, my childhood in itself was fantastic. I didn't have a particularly close relationship with my dad, which um, had... I don't know, I guess that kind of had repercussions. Did he um, live nearby? Um, he did live nearby. And I think that's what kind of made it worse was to know that he lived nearby, but just wasn't present in my life. Um, I've come to learn now that, you know, he had many of his own issues going on at the time and something that I can understand now as an adult. But as a child, you just want your dad. So where were your parents from? It, it says on Wikipedia that your dad was Zimbabwean. Yes, I don't know who put that there, um, but they seem to have run run with it. And it's not, it, you know, uh, it wouldn't make a difference if he was. But um, both of my parents are Jamaican. And my dad's from Spanish Town in uh, Jamaica and my mum is from Westmoreland in Jamaica. And, and so where, where did the sort of the dreams come from as a child? I mean, were, were you, was your mum a sort of a pushy mum wanting you to succeed or, or was that all from you? My mum was not a pushy mum at all. My mum was a creative mum and she was very, very supportive of everything that we wanted to do. So when I told her I wanted to be a karate dan, she put me into karate and I loved it. And then I wanted to be a forensic scientist. She got me a microscope and stuff. She, she always made a way to ensure that we were able to kind of live our dreams or experiment and have opportunities. Looking back now, I just don't know how she did it. I just feel like she's just a superwoman because with the means that she had, you know, she was not well off at all. The The idea of becoming a singer was not actually something that I thought I could do. I've said this before that I feel like it's when, like, like when a girl dreams of being a princess and then actually getting the opportunity to become a princess, you never actually really think it's going to happen. But for me, it did. And even now, even looking back, it just feels completely surreal that I had and have and live the life I do to this day. I still feel like, oh, someone's going to come and say, oh, just just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and were you always the super talented child? Um, I think I was just always brave. I was always uh, willing to give it a go. I think I was definitely creative and I get that from my mom. I loved making up songs. Music was a big thing in our house and I loved to perform, but it was just fun. It was just a hobby to me. It was never something that I thought could possibly be a career. You know, I, my, my ambition went as far as, you know, I'm going to work in the local corner shop. That was my ambition, <laughs> which sounds really bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was your identity? I mean, you talked about sort yeah. of being very aware of your Jamaican roots. I presume your Birmingham identity is as... Yes. In and I think I think this is where I get a lot of my... Um, 
I, I hate the word activism, but it's the only word that I can kind of uh, relate to how I feel about certain social issues. Um, and and I think my my bravery or insistence on being a voice and being heard, because the way that I grew up for me was just so beautiful. You know, it was a real melting pot of cultures, of ages, of religions, of, you know, races, of food, like just everything. It was just, you know, we had the opportunity to mix with every kind of person. And for me, I kind of feel that that was really, truly enriching for me as a human being. But also, um, I do think it's quite synonymous with, it's particularly with the area of Birmingham that I grew up in, um, in a city Birmingham. So, you know, I, w I didn't have any preconceptions about anyone or any, you know, any gender or, um, you know, sexuality. Um, as I said, race, religion, it was just people were just people. And I think that's one of the things that I kind of now, as an adult with a platform and a voice, I just feel compelled to speak about things. I'm just like, I I can't, I can't deal with what, what I essentially feel is injustice. Birmingham, I, I don't know, it's just beautiful. And it's why I've decided to raise my children here. I could, I could, you know, I could have been anywhere, but um, I love Birmingham so much and I wanted my children to have that same experience and they've done better for it as well. You know, my, my eldest daughter is 20, my middle daughter is going to be 16 this year and then my youngest is three, but they're non-judgmental, tolerant of everything and open-minded um, and that's exactly what I want for my children because that's exactly how I was raised. How, how did you make this leap then? from a fairly normal upbringing in Birmingham to being a pop star? I think I just believed I could. could. And I think, again, my parents, so neither of my parents achieved greatness, but for some reason they insisted that we were capable of achieving whatever we wanted to, to do in life. And so even when I got to places where I was met with resistance, I just was like, well, I can, you know, I, me I remember having, um, doing a showcase at 16. So I did a performance and I remember overhearing a conversation and it was like, you know, oh, she, you know, she's fantastic. She's really great voice, but she's way too dark. And I remember I'm, I, at, that, at that point, 16, fresh from Birmingham, I was like, what, what does that even mean? And, and, but in my head, it was just like, oh, well, I'll show you, won't I? It was just kind of like, well, I can, you know. What you heard that being said yes. in your presence? Yes, that you were too yeah. dark. I was, I, yeah, I was, I, I was too dark to make it in the music industry. That's one of. Well, was it a white person? Yeah, yeah, it was. A, it was a white man. Yeah. It was a white man. I'll never forget. I'm not going to say his name, but um, yeah, I distinctly remember the conversation, and um, and it was somebody that I ended up you know, working with <laughs> for years, yeah. <laughs> which was... Did, did you ever talk to him about never, that comment? Never, never, Because sometimes... Because I suppose he, 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 would, he, would, he would say he was saying that in terms of a commercial judgment, oh, of course, presumably, rather of course. than his own racism. Of course, of course it's, it's completely important to understand, you know, even him feeling... I'm sure nobody would say that now, but it's also important for me to understand he can only speak from his own experience. And I think that's one of the major issues we have when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to who are the gatekeepers of, of the entertainment industry, the media industry, when it comes to that, you know, if these are the gatekeepers, um, how much chance do you really have? I mean, I just, because I was so green, I was just like, well, I can, I can do it. You know, I was so defiant. It didn't really affect me. I remember it because I just remember being completely thrown by the comments. It didn't make sense to me. I'd never even heard anything like that before. So um to hear to hear that comment, it was um yeah, it's 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 stuck with me for for all these years. Well do you think there was any truth to it? I th oh my gosh. I Commercially, think, coldly. I think I think if you look at, you know, if you look at even now, if you look at who the big stars are, you know, black female artists you know um I do think that things have changed but the darker they are the less likely they are to have huge success which is why when dark-skinned women black women have huge success it's even more um incredible because it's like oh my gosh you made it it shouldn't be that way because it's 
it it's skin <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't make any sense but at the same time it does make a difference there are you know opportunities afforded to people with lighter skin that people with darker skin just don't get and um how did race affect you once you i mean because you 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 became successful yeah. you had top top 20 yeah. hits um does, does the racism sort of fall away at that stage because now you're a success I just remember noticing that I was always, you know, <laughs> either the or one of the only black people in the room. And it didn't make me feel uncomfortable because, it, as I said, I just had so much self-belief. My parents had filled me with so much self-belief that it, it didn't occur to me that it was an issue. It really didn't. Um, and then it wasn't until I tried to transition into TV that I realised that they were actual racial disparities and 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 how I could understand that the reason I'm not having these opportunities is because of the colour of my skin and that really sent me for um you know on a on a downward spiral it really affected me profoundly um and I think particularly getting to that age I was about 26 27 and realizing oh it's not because you're not good it's because you don't look like Holly Willoughby, you know? And it was like, wow. Um, but then you still try. How, how could you be sure that that's what it was? I mean, or what made you feel that that's what it was? Because because, because I, I know I'm talented. I know I'm talented. I know I'm capable. It, it's a, this, this is the thing as well. I, you know, the, even the idea of how how do you quantify that? How do you prove something like that? But there's a saying, he who feels it knows it. And, and that's the thing. I'm not like this bitter person. I'm not someone who's vying for, oh, I really want these opportunities. I just kind of feel the UK in particular, they're not ready for that yet. They're not, not ready. I think actually now, right now, you know, so in this year of lockdown, it, there seems to be a kind of consciousness developing. And, and I'm all for it um, and I definitely don't want to be someone who is contributing to um, a negative idea of um, of what the media is but as someone who has existed within the entertainment industry for the last 20 odd years I can only call it as I see it and and what I see and what I know is that the color of my skin has affected you know whether or not I get to work in the entertainment industry particularly in the capacity I would prefer like, I would prefer not to be on TV talking about race. There are so many other things I could talk about. There are so many other roles and passions that I have. But I know, talk about race, then, you know, you'll get a, an opportunity to... Well, I mean, you did, didn't you? I mean, because you were on Loose Women, and that, that was the, sort of the classic talk about everything. And then, and then you did, and then it all went wrong. <laughs> yeah. But this, this is the thing, it's like... When you run shows like that, you are um, you're kind of uh, coached before you go on the show. So you have to have a meeting every morning um, about what we're going to say in response to whatever the questions are. For instance, if I was going to say something that they would deem as problematic, even if it was something that that affected me personally, it would be like, oh, you can't say that. You can't say that. So whilst it may seem I did I this is the thing it's like I feel as if I'm speaking badly about something I care about because I loved being on Loose Women I loved the opportunity to to be on a live show in that capacity to to seemingly be myself but there was a lot of policing of what I was allowed to say and then there was the whole let, let's call it the plus size row the way that that was so uh, sorry let me just explain what that is so um I was on a show, we were talking about, it wasn't about plus size clothing, it was about extreme size clothing. Um, and I, along with every other woman on the panel who was white, mentioned, you know, my point of view, who we all agreed on the same point of view, but I was vilified for it. And not only that, I wasn't protected after that point. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't given an opportunity. We we went back and we spoke uh, in the green room about, you know, uh, I remember some of the other women saying, why can't we just say that the reaction of the press is racist? Like, why can't we say that? And they were like, yeah, well, we have no proof and our lawyers will get in trouble. And it was just kind of like, again, you have a kind of realisation that oh, 
I can't survive here. I, I won't I won't survive in this environment. And it's not it's not that I can't continue to do that job, but I can't show up to work as my whole self. I can't be myself. I can't even be honest. I can't speak about my experiences. So some people it's like, yes, but you were given the opportunity and you were on the show for how many? Yes, I was, but I was not allowed to show up as my whole self. I was not allowed to make mistakes. I was not allowed to... That's the thing, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's, it's the ability to make mistakes yeah. and to learn from mm -hmm. them and to carry on. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, because in that particular instance, yeah. you know, you, you, what you said mm -hmm. was about whether, you know, big clothes should be in mm -hmm. mainstream shops mm -hmm. And whether people not should plus be made size, to feel by the uncomfortable way. for yeah, being. Yeah, not plus size. Anyway, yeah. And and so it was seen as sort of fattest, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But this is the point, mm. isn't it? That, you know, you were, you were basically kind of dropped as a result of that. Yeah. I found out that I wasn't coming back to Loose Women because they had a photo shoot and I realised and I was like, oh, am, am I not doing the photo shoot? And they were like, oh, no. But I don't understand what I did. And is that something you felt elsewhere as well? So since leaving Loose Women... I um I've had many you know I've I've still continued and cuz I really I really wanted to work in particularly in TV I love working in television I love it but then um I've noticed on several occasions you know um well similar scenarios basically I did a couple of stints on the right stuff which then turned into Jeremy Vine I love Jeremy by the way but um but again every time I appeared on the show I was vilified for a point of view that we all would have on the panel. And it just got to the stage where I was just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. It really profoundly affected me. I, I can't show up as my whole self. I can't be honest. And it's, you know, if you're talking particularly about race, then you, they just want to shout you down. And it's just like, well, mm. and when I say, when I, when I speak about these things profoundly affecting me, I mean, like, you know, um, I, I have serious bouts of depression. I've recently gone on to antidepressants. Like, you know, it's it profoundly affects my life. I love, as I said at the beginning, I love performing. I just kind of feel like the UK industry is not ready to have the types of conversations that I would like to be a part of. Personally, I'm not willing to have those conversations if I'm going to get attacked every time I do. So I would much rather take a step back and just do my own thing. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've got like a YouTube channel and, and I kind of scratch the same itch. I kind of feel like, you know, I, I still get to perform. I still get to present. And, you know, it may seem like incredibly small scale to, you know, live on ITV at lunchtime, but this, this is what I love to do and I'm going to do you know, you've also sort of gone into you know hair and makeup yeah. and things like that. How, how you know difficult has it been to have sort of commercial success with products? I feel it's very important to be a representative, and I recently went from having um, straight relaxed hair. Well, well, it was about four or five years ago to wearing my hair naturally in its natural afro, and it was seen as such a big deal. And um, and I just thought, well. Let's talk more about this. Let's talk more about why it's such a big deal and why, you know, because this is how my hair naturally grows from my head. Um, I have three daughters and their hair is exactly the same. Again, like there are so many other things that I'm passionate about. I think when it comes to the UK media industry, you probably think I'm only passionate about race. I'm not even passionate about race. I'm just, I just, I'm just an expert because I'm black and, you know, it's, it sounds pathetic, but I really think that's what it is. Um, but yeah, I'm so passionate about hair. I love makeup, beauty, skincare. When we speak about commercial success, I think we always want to think about millions and I just don't have those kinds of dreams. I've never had those kinds of dreams. Um, for me, I kind of feel like as long as I can feed my family and we are happy and healthy and, you know, have heating and wearing warm clothes, then that's happiness and contentment to me. Um, I definitely don't need to be selling millions of records. And I think, I think maybe it's because I've already done that as well. I've, I've made millions and and this is the thing it's like from growing up in a working class inner city background to being a multi-millionaire I think I was happier when I was in, in Hockley just because 
I, I, I don't know. I, th- I think I had the blinkers on. I think I just, it was beautiful. And I'm not saying I regret my life because I've, I'm now able and capable of doing some phenomenal things. But fame and money has never, ever been my motivation. So for me, it's more about using my platform to to do good. I mean, when you say you sort of, you've, you've made millions, yeah. I mean, which, which bit of your career has been the most financially successful? Um, between... Maybe about like 2000 and when, uh, maybe like 2003 and 2010 was probably my most lucrative. Like it was, it was, it was ridiculous. Like to the point where I kind of feel <laughs> a bit uncomfortable. You know, you do like crazy shows and, you know, private jets around the world and stuff like that. And someone who's from Hockley, I don't know. It's it's just all a bit weird. But how how does it sit with your politics? Because you know, because you're also political. Yeah. You know, you've you've supported yeah. Labour and or Jeremy yeah, Corbyn yeah. specifically. Yes. So it's not it's not just sort of soft mm-hmm. um, soft left no. politics. That's you know <laughs> that's Labour socialism. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. So wh- wh- how does your life fit with you know your politics? I think my life has actually served my politics in a really great way to know that um, you can essentially socially migrate, but still experience the same ceilings and issues that you would if you were in the inner city. Um, for me, I would describe myself as socially conscious. And and that just, I, for me, that just means being aware of other people, being empathetic. Um, earning Earning lots of money is not something that I feel bad about but what I will say I wish I had been more socially conscious at that point in my career because the things that I would have done with those with that kind of money you know um I'm unable to do today what what sort of things do you mean (sighs) there are so many things like you know I probably would have bought buildings I probably would have opened schools I would have um definitely been been of service more to my community now I'm I'm more of service to my community as a as a kind of a figurehead or an ambassador. But um, a lot of the time it's money. It's money that, you know, the inner city needs and could benefit from. I don't want to pry, but just because you mentioned that, you you know, you've, you've gone on to antidepressants recently. What you've talked about in this conversation, um, and thank you for being so open, by the way, is, you know, that happiness is... Is, is not about money. Happiness is about family. You've got family, you've got a partner. Um, you know, you're obviously stable and you've made lots of money and you've got a nice home and all the rest of it. So why am I depressed? Why anti- <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. So um, back in March, um, I did a series of interviews um, around the Meghan and Harry thing. This is going to sound so bizarre, but I'm glad you're asking me this because I think it's really important that people understand the impact of some of these things that 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 they ask of black women. Um, so I did a series of interviews. I remember kind of reading the response to the things that I was talking about. And, and essentially what I was doing was talking about my experience as a black British woman, how the, the media industry does not do enough to protect and um and celebrate black british women and i also kind of mentioned how i how some of what megan mentioned resonated with me and then to kind of have that rubbished or dismissed or you know by thousands of people it affected me but not only that i think when um when people ask you to kind of regurgitate or to speak again about something you've spoken about so many times before and then you know ask you're you're asked how do you feel you know how does it make you feel why do you think we have a race problem I just I just broke down I just broke down and I was just and and when I say I broke down I mean kind of internally I, I, I just became really just broken I just felt as if I'd I'd been physically hurt and and then it started affecting how I interacted with my family and you know I was becoming very withdrawn this isn't the first time I've been offered antidepressants but it is the first time that I've actually taken them and it was because I I could see no let up as I as I said to you earlier 
I love working in TV. My dream is to work in TV. Still to this day, I would love to have the opportunity to work in TV as myself, you know, be able to show up to work as my whole self. It's like a tug of war because I really want this thing, but I feel like everyone hates me. I feel like the industry actually hates me. <laughs> this just sounds so weird to say out loud, but that's exactly what I felt. But I, but I think I think what's important as well, it's not, it's not just about me. It's also, I can watch another black woman being questioned or interrogated and being told, you know, given unfair questions on TV. And I just think, oh, you know, I, I can feel it as well. It's a really hard one because it's such a huge thing. It's such a huge thing. And it's, and, and it's very hard to quantify and to say to you, this is what the thing is. Yeah. Um, and also what we should be doing differently is very hard because, I mean, you know, you came on Channel 4 News yeah. around that time. You did one of yes. those interviews for yeah. us. So I hope we didn't contribute to yeah. you feeling mm. this way, but I imagine mm. we will have done. And, you know, but what should we do instead? Because obviously we want your view. We want that. We want you to come on and reveal so, how you feel about what's going on. I think, I th so. And we don't, we, we, you know, we mm. don't want to gaslight you of in course, the process. Of, this, this is the thing. I think I'm very aware of the intention. Whenever I'm asked to be on the, these shows, I understand that, you know, there's an intention, but I understand why you may think you need the voice of a black person but race is not a racism is not a black issue it's an issue for for people who are treating people of color badly and i think so when you have these conversations they they need to be with the intention of actually solving the problem because what i, th I think um the george floyd situation is a perfect example the same conversations that are happening around George Floyd, the anniversary of, of his death now, are the same conversations we were having a year ago. And to me, that shows a lack of progress. It shows that we haven't really done or solved or made any steps towards anything great. And that's really quite sad. Yes, I mean, I, I have this sort of problem as yeah. well because I was in Minneapolis um, a few weeks yeah. ago. Um, around the shooting of Dante Rice. Oh. And, and, you know, there were lots of shootings. Yeah. You know, we could have done a different one each yeah. day. Oh, my goodness. It was the same feeling that sort of, I'm not, you know, what what has mm. changed? Well, what's changed has been we've had a year of protest and debate mm. and Black Lives Matter, mm. and it's been very foreground, and TV companies have signed up to pledges to reflect the communities they serve mm. better. Um, so something has changed, but the violence hasn't. And, and the thing is, it, it's not just about visibility. It's not just about we need to see a black face here. It's more about, you know, what is actually being done, at, you know, at a grassroots level, what changes are being made to um, internal company policies. What, you know, what are we doing to protect, p protect? And it's not, again, it's not just about race for me. It's about anyone who is other. I, I just kind of feel like I have this real idealistic idea of what of what life can be and how we can live. And for me, I kind of feel like the more we know about each other, the more we uh, kind of cross pollinate and, and, and communicate and um, spend time with each other, the more um, enriched will be. It's not just about listening to black people. It's also speaking to each other. You know, what do you know? What do you need to know? You know, what has been said? Um, recently, there's been a lot of talk about um, racism against uh, Southeast Asian people. I had no idea it was a thing. And, and, but my first thought was, I need to know more. I, I need to know more. I didn't know about this. How can I help? What can I do? I mean, it, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you know, it's interesting that you, you know, you're saying that because, um, you know, the flip side of this, and there will be reactions to this podcast. Yeah. I've no, no, yeah. doubt, you know, where people say, "Oh, there's Krishna with <laughs> yes. his woke podcast." And, <laughs> yeah. You know, what, what's your response to sort of those people who say this is all this this year yeah. since the George Floyd thing has all just been sort of wokery? You know, it's woke woke. For, from personally, there. I kind of feel like uh, we have to step back and ask ourselves, what does woke mean? To me, walk means consciousness, it means awareness, it means empathy, it means paying attention. And I don't understand why there's a resistance to that. Why is there a resistance to understanding somebody else's experience or point of view? Um, particularly in this day and age, we don't have to engage with it if we don't want to. 
But what I will say is, why would you be against that? Like, I, I think we should all be willing to learn, you know, um, pe people would probably describe my children as woke, because I want them to be aware, not only of themselves, not only of their own experiences. I want them to be aware of the different types of people that are out there, the different environments you could live in, the different cultures and religions and um, and see all of those things as, as beautiful parts of the tapestry of the world. Because I feel like a huge part of our um, problem is that we we separate ourselves or we or we or we we have the blinkers on and you know the only reason that people are becoming woke is because you've got nothing else to do because you know we've all been on lockdown we've all been in our phones and watching the news and stuff and um and i personally think it's fantastic you know um there there are a lot of things that i've learned over this past 12 months that i will take with me you know forever and my children as well conversations that you know i I couldn't fathom before and I didn't understand, but now I do and, you know, may have a little something to say on it. I might not be an expert, but I feel, okay, well, that's, that, that benefits me. I'm grateful that I know this new piece of information and, you know, and I think we should all become information seekers. I, I think that that's what breeds empathy. You, when you know more about people, you're able to understand them. And when you understand them, you can, live alongside them and that's what we should be doing I know I just might sound like such a <laughs> weirdo but that's genuinely how I feel <laughs> I, I just want to ask you yeah. um as well about about our family at the yeah. moment so I mean um so you have this podcast with your yes. husband <laughs> and we, we can hear yeah. him and we, we hear you talking about the most intimate yeah thing. um but we don't know who yeah. he is <laughs> Which is really quite weird. Yeah, yeah, it, it 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 might be weird, especially because I'm someone again. As I said earlier, I love to share. I love to share, um, but um, honestly, I keep my husband away out of the limelight because I believe that the press will tear him tear him apart because um because he's been to prison. And because of that, you know, I, I just don't want to experience that. I don't want to experience, I don't want him to experience that. And also, he's not interested in the limelight. He doesn't have Instagram or anything himself. Like he's, you know, he's not that kind of person. But for me, I've kept him to myself out of protection for him and our family. Because what I know the papers will write, our children will see. You know, we've got three children who will be able to read a newspaper and I, I just I just don't I just don't want to I don't want to experience that I've experienced many things like it and I don't want to experience it again and so we're happy being I don't know <laughs> closed off and that's the thing he's not a secret like you know if you were my friend you would have met him you'd know who he was <laughs> but yeah it's just yeah I'm just very afraid of what the media would do to him and our family you know crook crime and criminality in prison and things mm. like that you know sort of this this is um intruded into your life through the coverage of your stepbrother mm. and you know your sort of your, your, your life. i mean you could sort of imagine you know uh, you know jamedia grew up in this sort of gangland world um, <laughs> which i didn't by the way <laughs> well exactly it's kind of, i mean how you know what what is the what is the reality of that and how what is your approach then mm. to i mean you know you, it's interesting you say my husband's been to prison yeah. How do you view and how do you forgive mm. that kind of past? So, um, again, it's about it's about seeking understanding. You know, I'm I'm I don't judge people. I'm always willing to have a conversation. I'm always willing to learn. You know, I, I don't want to be with a criminal. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to be with someone who's committing crime. So, you know, there's I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if I need to reassure you, but take reassurance in that, that, you know, I'm not yes. like with like an active criminal. <laughs> no, 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 I know that. I know that. But, but, <laughs> but for me, you know, so, so, but for me, because of the experiences of my brothers and my dad, you know, I've, I've been visiting a prison since I was about three years old. It's not something to me that's like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I understand the humanity of the people in those situations. I understand the circumstances that can lead someone to um, ending up in prison. Whilst I don't support 
crime. I'm not a supporter of any crime whatsoever. To me, someone who has committed a crime is still a person. And, you know, and it didn't it didn't write him off as being, you know, a potential suitor for me. And um, he's an amazing, amazing man. Like, you know, he's yeah, he's absolutely incredible. And I, I feel like I would have really missed out had had I, you know, thought, oh, you've been to prison. Well, no, you know, I would have really missed out. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you've been visiting prison since you were a child, then um, what's your view of prison? I mean, again, it's, I mean, that's a huge issue of sort of prison reform. Do you have thoughts on that? I, I <laughs> how long have you got, Christina? <laughs> like, honestly, so when it comes to prison now, um, as I said, so my dad was in and out of prison. So I used to visit him um, in prison sometimes. Um, and then my brother uh, was convicted, I think, in 2005. Um, so he's um, been there for a very long time. Um I think eight, coming up to 18 years. So I've been visiting him. I'm not going to say to you, oh, it's normal. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's something I have to do if I want to see these particular people that I love. It's something that I have to, you know, that I have to be a part of. That being said, I, it really hurts me to see how, um, again, <laughs> I've got a real issue with the media, but how the media deals with, um, criminality, um, how it informs society's view of people who have committed crimes, because I feel that it um, it takes something away from them um, in terms of rebuilding their lives. And um, and that's what, you know, I don't think anybody actually wants to just be a criminal. I don't think anybody wants to go out there and do bad things. I think for me, I have an acute understanding of the fact that circumstances can lead anyone to commit a crime. You know, I could be a criminal under the right circumstances, so could you. But I feel like a lot of us feel as if we're, you know, a thousand steps removed from any form of crime. Um, I think there's something like 80,000 families in the UK who have a member of the family in prison, uh, you know, and so I, I'm unafraid to talk about, you know, my connection to someone who's in prison. I'm not, you know, obviously... I'm not so I'm not condoning crime. I don't know how many times I can say this, but I feel as if I need to say it. But whilst I'm not condoning crime, I love my family. I, I don't know how else to say it, you know, and I, uh, even to say that sentence, I feel as if, oh, I shouldn't I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that I love my brother. I shouldn't say that I love my dad, you know, but I do. Do you have any sense of why you are the, the woman who talks about empathy, who's been a huge success um, and who's made millions and your brother is the one who's in prison? I've always described my um, me getting a record deal at 15 as, uh, as my golden ticket. And I think that me being offered my record deal was exactly that for me. I got a way out. I'd, I don't know who I would be had I been... Had I remained in that environment, you know, had I um, become a teenager and started going out and mixing in God knows what kinds of circles, you know, I, I, I totally understand, you know, who my brother was exposed to at, you know, at 13, 14, while my mum was at work. And I, I can totally see and understand how he got caught up in, you know, a terrible lifestyle whilst me at the same age I was off doing rehearsals and dance you know dance rehearsals and in the studio and doing singing classes and getting my hair and makeup done I had a totally different experience um as particularly that point in my life 14 15 16 I was working but as I said I described my record deal as a golden ticket I and this is why I don't, you know, I, th I feel like there's, it's like a, a hairline difference, you, you know, like that film Sliding Doors, who knows, who knows what would, who I would be had this not happened. And also I have to say, please don't think that because I went off and enjoyed this life that I was immune to some of the circumstances that happen to uh, people in the inner city, because I still had an inner city working class mindset, which didn't always serve me well in this kind of elite environment but um that's another show 
<laughs> so if you could let, let, let let's get I mean you've talked a lot about empathy and so I yeah. imagine this will this will be part of your answer mm. I mean if you could change the world anyway yeah. how would you change it I'd start with the kids I would make empathy being woke <laughs> being aware socially conscious tolerant um, and experiencing other people's sexualities genders cultures races um, I would make all of those things imperative like you know they, they would have to be studied at at a you know school educational level um and and a lesson that follows them through you know from reception all the way to university um I really believe it that children are the answer I really do I think that if we um allow our children to be open-minded and tolerant and well-rounded that's how we change the world Jimmy, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much on. for having me. Our producer is Rachel Evans. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Until next time, bye-bye.